And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Social Development. Uh, questions number 2, 5 and 10 have been withdrawn. And I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number 1. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. It would be a, not be appropriate for me to outline the findings of the fact-finding investigation, as this report uh, is in relation to a personnel matter, and it is an established principle that such information be treated as confidential. I call Mrs. Joanne Dawson for supplementary. I was going to thank the minister for his answer, but it's really a non-answer. Maybe if we can explore it a bit more deeply. Minister, despite a direct request from the head of the civil service and the report being conducted by DFP, that minister is still Phoebe trying to claim the issue had nothing to do with him. So either he is avoiding his duties or he is wrongly trying to protect a party colleague. Nevertheless, can you this minister question, tell us what legal advice his department and former minister previously got, where it came from and whether we will be able to let this assembly see it? Uh, it's quite clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the member is not aware of the issues of how uh, legal advice is retained in this House. And equally, uh, I would remind the member that this is an issue which was dealt with my, by my predecessor, and that is where it rests. Nicole Dolores Kelly. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, can I ask uh, whether or not you actually familiarised yourself with the the findings of the report and uh, what uh, conclusion have you reached in relation to it, if you can share that? It, in terms of, of this situation, I think that uh, it's quite clear that there are others who are more interested in this issue uh, than uh, is the case in the terms of the, uh, the matters which refer to the department. Since I came into office, my focus and attention has been on ensuring that I get to grips with what are the responsibilities that I have as a minister. And I think that when we look across the piece in terms of the many issues which the member and other members in this House have, I think that that should be the priority, that should be the focus, and that is where I believe the issue in relation to this particular matter rests. And I repeat again, it has been an issue for my predecessor. He made the decisions that he made, and that is where the issue, as far as I am concerned, remains. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. This was a fact-finding investigation initiated by the Permanent Secretary, not by the Minister. And doubtless it made findings of fact about Mr. the Special Advisor's role as a civil servant. What are the facts that the Minister is so anxious to hide? And why is he ducking and diving? to hold from the public domain the finding of facts. Does that not speak the, the greatly member has asked this as question. to the attitude Minister. of the Department to this particular matter? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. The issue is an issue in relation to the personnel. It's a matter, a personnel issue, and as I would not be rele releasing information in relation to any individual within my department, the same is said in relation to this issue, I repeat again for those that may be of slow hearing or slow learning that this slow is a matter learning. for my predecessor, and that's where the issue remains. Robin Swan is not in his place. I call Paul Gervin. Question number four. I thank the member for uh, his uh, question. The review of the stock transfer scheme was commissioned in February of this year, and the review group concluded that the current model will not deliver the announced programme, and therefore a different approach has been proposed, focusing on a smaller number of schemes, uh, with each scheme comprising larger bundles of, of properties. And this has been endorsed by the Housing Executive Board, and I have also approved the proposals. I have written to the Chairman of the Housing Executive asking him to develop a revised programme of stock transfer schemes as one element of a wider initiative to improve and invest in the Northern Ireland Housing Executive properties. Once a revised programme is agreed, the Housing Executive will write to all the affected tenants to clarify if they are to remain in the programme and, if so, uh, the timescales that would be involved. 
Additionally, given <coughs> the delays in the programme to date, I have agreed that stall plan maintenance schemes for the properties that have been included in the original stock transfer programme can now proceed. The Housing Executive will also continue to undertake normal response maintenance works where necessary. I call Paul Gervin for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. And could he maybe expand upon what areas within South Antrim uh, there is a proposal to do transfers and what protections are going to be there for those that are Housing Executive tenants currently? Well, in relation to the stock condition uh, survey that is currently underway, uh, that will provide a firm basis to enable a strategic decision to be taken regarding what properties are to be included in the revised programme. It is not possible to predict the results of the survey or comment of the possible outcome of any specific areas at this stage. However, once a revised programme is agreed, uh, the Housing Executive will write to all the affected tenants to clarify if they are to remain in the programme and, if so, the time scales involved. And can I also say to the member that I am quite happy to give him an assurance that this will be done with the agreement and the consent of the residents. And I think that is a vitally important issue because I am well aware of the concerns that have been expressed to me by others and by indeed himself in regards to concerns that re uh, tenants particularly have in relation to elements of this process and I am quite happy to give that assurance that it will not be done in a way which is in any way uh, ignoring the concerns that are raised uh, by tenants. Pat Ramsey. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his response. Could I ask the Minister, is he and his department committed to ensuring that social housing largely remains within the public sector? Yes, I, I think I am. And, and I have to say that since coming to office, there is something, and I have discussed this with uh, officials and I have discussed it with even a number of members in this House. That is, we will have to have a discussion. While there are a number of reviews that are going on, and um, the department has, uh, in conjunction with the housing executive, set out a, a policy direction, I think that there are issues that we need to address in terms of how we are delivering in terms of specific areas and specific needs. And I'm quite happy to have those discussions with members, with the committee, and with the organisations. But in terms of ensuring that we have a social house, housing provision within the public sector. That is my intention, to keep it there, but I believe that we do have to make progress in terms of how the housing executive in particular delivers. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The uh, Minister will be aware of the large number of derelict and ab abandoned buildings uh, that are blights uh, on our landscape. Is he envious of the, the regime that applies in England where councils can acquire these properties through compulsory possession orders and would he give consideration to such a scheme here where uh, you cannot establish the ownership of these derelict properties? Uh, I thank the, the member for his question. I think that uh, when you look at any jurisdiction you will see variances in relation to how they particularly apply uh, a policy. When you come to the area of housing, you have a variety of approaches. In terms of the issue of housing, uh, the member will be aware that uh, there was a proposal to have the regeneration and housing bill. And in that proposal, there was reference made to powers that were been given uh, to local councils. Unfortunately, uh, other members in the House uh, felt that those provisions were a step too far. And I expended a considerable amount of time uh, when coming to office uh, in the early stages to try and address those concerns. And as a result of that, we now have a different bill, a bill which primarily focuses on the regeneration element and doesn't primarily give consideration to the elements in regards to housing. One of those elements would have been uh, particularly around houses of multiple occupancy, and I think that that could have led us to a position where we would have looked at uh, particular locations where dereliction is the case. But what I am quite happy to do uh, is to uh, give consideration to what the, the member has said in the light of the ongoing review that we have in regards to the future of housing provision in Northern Ireland, because I share the concern that the member has raised that there are locations where 
uh, you have dereliction and it becomes very difficult to find out who is the owner and who ultimately is the person responsible for addressing that need. I call Barry Mickletoff. Question number six, Cash de Verichet. Thank the, the member for his question. Between May 2011 and uh, the 31st of October 2014, the last date for which data is available, the Northern Ireland Co-Ownership Housing Association received 163 applications and to support it, the purchase of 77 affordable, affordable homes in West Tyrone constituency area at a total value of £8 million at the time of purchase. A further 17 priorities uh, are currently in the process of being purchased and uh, in the area that is a total value of almost £2 million. It is important to remember that the shared equity housing that co-ownership provides is demand-led and potential home buyers approach the association with a property already selected. I call Barry McElduff for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer? Uh, of course, co-ownership will suit some, but there are towns and villages in West Tyrone that haven't seen social houses built for years, indeed decades. Can I ask the Minister if he's aware of the waiting list for social housing in both the Oma and Stravan districts, and maybe to explain how his department plans to address this objective need? Okay. Thank the, the member, and obviously this is uh, uh, an issue, and uh, it was not that long ago, in fact, just when I took up office that I uh, made a, a comment, and I, I stand by the comment in regards to the important role that co-ownership plays in terms of provision of housing. And also, I have to say that we have ensured that the model that we use, the financial model that we use has to be revised because I don't believe that we have currently all the financial tools in place to give us uh, the outcome that uh, we have. I think it's also important to re remember that co-ownership housing is necessarily demand-led and the potential house buyers approach the association. So while the member says about other specific areas, I think it is important to ensure that within those particular areas that those who see the need are actually are, are raising the concern because of the way in which the uh, system operates. It operates on a demand-led uh, system and the potential of those home uh, buyers to approach the association with a property already selected. And if the member uh, wants to have further uh, detail in relation to Sturban or any other uh, part of his constituency, I'm quite happy to furnish him with further uh, information. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister also um, for his answers thus far. And we all, as community representatives, would be aware not only for the need of social housing in our areas, but also affordable housing. Um, could the Minister maybe go into a bit more detail of what role does co-ownership co and affordable housing have in addressing um, our high housing demands? Well, I think it, it plays a very important role, and uh, co-ownership homes, which are offered on a shared equity basis. Uh, provide an alternative to the social housing for people who want to purchase their own homes but can't afford to do so without some particular help or intervention. There has been a high and sustained public demand for the scheme, mostly from first-time buyers wanting to take uh, an opportunity uh, and to actually grasp that opportunity uh, but with a lower cost first step uh, onto the property ladder. And it also provides an alternative housing solution to those who would otherwise join the social housing waiting list or become part of the private rental market. So it is something that I want to continue to encourage. It's something that I think we need to continue to look at as a very good financial model and something which I do believe gives to first-time buyers, but not exclusively to first-time buyers, the opportunity to be in possession of their own home. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, and for the Minister, the budget for the co ownership scheme has previously been given major additional allocations because of the previous Minister's underspending on social housing development programme. Does the current Minister accept that, as positive and successful as co ownership is, it should not be used to provide political cover for managerial failures? Well, I, I don't accept the premise that the question is based on. 
and, and I think it's just a, a typical uh, assault by a party that wants to have the privilege of being in government and not take responsibility for any of the decisions yeah. that happens to flow from a five-party mandatory coalition. I know the member has difficulty understanding that that is the case, but here is the situation. Let's remember where the, the change of policy came. Let's remember it wasn't whenever my colleague was in post that the focus changed in terms of how we deliver housing. It was actually whenever Margaret Ritchie and the SDLP was in possession of the Department of Social Development that we saw a change in focus and a change in emphasis. But I, I would say to the member that in terms of the affordability of any of these schemes, they all currently are under uh, financial pressure. And the reason for that is because the envelope, the money that we have to spend in terms of the delivery of any element within my department will solely be dependent on how I can ensure that the money that uh, I have to save is found and also then the impact that that will have on a variety of schemes. And I have to say to the member and to uh, the, the House that that is going to be an extremely difficult challenging place for me to be in and there is no doubt that that will create uh, criticism and will create uh, concerns by many. However, I will give uh, this assurance that in terms of the importance that I place on the provision of affordable as well as social homes, that that is something that is clearly on a priority list for me. Moving on, I call Alton McGuinness. Question 7, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank uh, the member for his, his question. And I recognise that there is a high demand for social housing across all communities in North Belfast. But I do not consider it to be a housing crisis. In terms of provision for new social homes, my department and the Northern Ireland Housing Executive have already invested heavily in social housing in the area. In fact, over the past five years, Almost a thousand new social homes have been delivered in the North Belfast parliamentary constituency at a cost of £140 million. A further 260 new social homes are currently under construction, and the Social Housing Development Programme also contains plans to deliver more than 370 additional homes over the next three years. Uh, through both new build and relets, much has been done to address housing need in this area, and we will continu continue to do all that we can within the constraints of the serious financial challenges that we face. And I, th I think the member will appreciate the comments that I made to the previous uh, questioner, that that will be a challenge for us. But I think that on the basis of what we have done to date, I think that it's clear that a commitment has been given and delivery has been provided for in relation to the constituency that the member represents. I call it Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, I welcome the uh, minister's um, look at North Belfast afresh. I think that's very important, and I know the minister will look at that very seriously, and I do welcome that. Uh, in relation to uh, his comments about there not being a crisis, uh, I think that the demand itself in Coming North Belfast uh, suggests that there is, in fact, a crisis. What I would ask the minister to do in particular is look afresh at the figures, but look in particular at the demand by Can single, the question, by single men yeah, uh, by single men in relation to housing in North Belfast. That definitely is very, very critical. And, uh, let's maybe take uh, a moment or two and, and set the situation in North Belfast in some context. And, and I do, and, and I've endeavoured to, since coming to the office, I've endeavoured to ensure that irrespective of where the location is, and in this case it's referenced to North Belfast, but any part of Northern Ireland, that we should not accept the 
uh, failure of whether it's a housing executive or any other agency in terms of the delivery of services to that community. And I think that's a challenge for us. It's a challenge for me uh, uh, as a minister, and it's something which I'm taking seriously. But let, let's look in terms of the figures. Uh, and I think you can't look at the figures in North Belfast in isolation. Because if you did that, I think it might suggest that there has been a drop in the number of houses completed in North Belfast. But let, let's look at the completions over the last number of years. From 2011-12, uh, there was 179 units. 2012-13, there was 182 units. And 2013-14, 124 units. However, in 14-15, to date, 198 units have been completed in the first eight and a half months, with a further 63 due for completion shortly. And this will make a total of 261 completions during this financial year, the largest to date. And there are a number of factors which influence when dwellings are completed, including the size, the length of construction, the contract, the time of the year the construction commence. And over the last five years, North Belfast has experienced the highest number of completions compared to any other parliamentary constituency. So I think that uh, it would also be fair to say that there remains a robust social housing build building programme in North Belfast with 229 starts uh, in 12-13 and 182 in 13-14. So I think that gives us a sense. In terms of the specific needs of individuals, that is an issue which I'm quite happy to raise uh, with the housing executive in terms of the category of individuals that he has made reference to. I call Nelson McCausland. Um, I, I welcome the fact that the Minister referred to the parliamentary constituency and the Assembly constituency of North Belfast and his commitment there to look at the whole constituency. Will he do all that he can to ensure that the housing executive delivers in all areas of the constituency to meet the need that's there? Thank the, the member. And, uh, I thought I was going to escape from uh, North Belfast in terms of uh, addressing issues in the constituency, but Absolutely that is, not. I will not ignore the needs of, of the, the people in North Belfast, or in East Belfast, or in South Belfast, or in uh, West. West Belfast. We better not forget uh, the four component parts of the city. But I have to say that it, it is an issue, and, and you know, if you look across the, the constituency, there is a high demand for social housing across all communities in North Belfast. And the latest figures that the housing executive has made available to me, and, and I have to say this to, to members, I do find it somewhat difficult <coughs> to give these figures. I'll give you the figures and then I'll say the reason why I find it difficult. The last figures that the housing executive have provided to me show that there are 1,485 Protestants and 1,585 87 Roman Catholics on the waiting list in North Belfast. These figures clearly demonstrate the need for social housing for both communities in North Belfast. I think that we have to move away, if we possibly can, from this uh, arbitrary uh, distribution of homes solely on the basis of what a person's religion is. However, that is the reality of where we are, and I think that I have to deal with that reality. And I think in terms of ensuring that we meet the need right across the community, I believe I'm committed to that, and it's a message which I've conveyed to the Housing Executive. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the questions which he has answered in respect of North Belfast. Can I ask one further question as, uh, in respect of North Belfast? And it is in relation to the type of housing that is uh, regularly allocated. And I have particular concerns and have received representations from those who are housed in inappropriate flats where families are expected to be housed in flats with little or no outdoor play or other facilities. What action will the Minister take to uh, move? that issue on as well? Well, I, I think the member raises a, a valid point in terms of ensuring that where not only you have the location uh, in terms of the provision that you make uh, as far as to the type of accommodation, but the location is also important. The difficulty is ensuring that we meet demand because uh, it was interesting that I uh, just made some inquiries in relation to the number of uh, properties or the, the number of times in which uh, people who make an application uh, actually refused an application. Yeah. 
And if, I think if you look at that, we have a situation where there's a large percentage of people who have refused on the second or third offer. And I think that makes it very difficult in terms of how you deal on an ongoing basis with the demand and also meeting that need. But in terms of space, in terms of available uh, recreation uh, provision, that is always a challenge. And I think that that is something which needs to be looked at, not only in conjunction with the, the Council and the Housing Executive, but with other providers to ensure that we are not only building the appropriate uh, type of dwelling, but also giving to communities the space that they need, because that is a key component part to a good, stable uh, community and environment. I call George Robinson. Question 8, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Uh, since the introduction of Make the Call advertising a campaign in 2011-12, over 36,000 people have been helped with their benefit entitlement, resulting in 10.8 million in additional income being generated. In 2013-14, Make the Call advertising campaign led to nearly 12,000 people receiving assistance, which led to over 4.6 million in additional income being generated. This was a 63% increase on the 12-13 figure. In 14-15, Make the Call advertising campaign consisting of television, press, outdoor advertising is being completed over two stages. The first set of adverts was broadcast during uh, June uh, 2014. The second commenced in October of, this, uh, of 14 and will run until February of 15 and the results will then uh, be published later on. And can I just say in relation to the Make Your Call, I think that is one of the success stories. Uh, I don't know whether it, I don't believe in premonitions, but uh, I was pleased that the Department of Social Development, when it launched the campaign in 13, that North Antrim was selected, and I had the opportunity to launch it in my own constituency of Ballymoney. However, I have to say, if I had known then that uh, what was going to happen to me now, I might have been a wee bit more reluctant in actually using North Antrim as the launch pad for the scheme. But I think it is something, and I would encourage all members to ensure that in their constituency offices, and I know the work that we are currently doing with Food Bank, that uh, we uh, have also included with the uh, food banks, uh, the food that goes out to people, a leaflet. Uh, which is informing people of the importance of the Make Your Call campaign and the access that people have to it. I call George Robinson for supplementary. Thank the Minister <clears throat> for his answer. And could I ask the Minister to outline if he would support the Make the Call campaign roadshow revisiting areas of high deprivation to ensure maximum benefit is gained by the most in need? Yes, uh, and, and I think it is something that we will continue to do. Obviously, after we come to the end of this particular uh, scheme or this particular uh, programme, we will have to be looking at how we are continuing to roll it out. I think given its success, uh, given uh, the very positive feedback that we have got from, from people, uh, I believe this has been something of value and worth. And we often, and, and I have no difficulty being uh, in, in government offices or government departments being criticised for our lack of ingenuity or our lack of uh, forward thinking. But on this particular issue, this has brought real benefit to families, to individuals, to communities, because this is money that they are entitled to. Remember, there is a, a, an entitlement here, and uh, I think that we need to continue to encourage that and uh, further road shows are something which we will give serious consideration to. Trevor Lund is not in his place. I call Chris Hazard. Question number 11, please. I thank the member for his question. And the, the housing executive has advised that they have 50 properties in South Down that have uh, room heaters as follows. 24 in the area covered by the Balm Bridge office, 18 in the area covered by the Downpatrick office and 8 in the area covered by the Newry office. The housing executive confirms all of these tenants were offered the option of changing their heating system as part of the heating replacement programme, but they chose to retain their original system. 
The Housing Executive will continue to offer these tenants an upgrade. Housing associations advise that they do not have any properties in South Down which are heated with glass fronted coal fires. That is the end of our period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms. Michelle McLevine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister tell us how many children across Northern Ireland have benefited from the work of the Child Maintenance Service in the last year? I think that uh, this is another example of uh, success that has uh, been secured. And again, it came about as a reorganisation within the Child Maintenance Service, and, and it's something which I think. Uh, while we would prefer that there, we did not need to have such a provision, uh, obviously for families it is vitally important. But during 2013-14, uh, the Child Maintenance Service collected or rearranged 27.2 million that supported 22,123 children right across Northern Ireland. And that was a record in terms of both money collected and children that benefited. We did this by reducing the number of non-paying cases, which in March this year was 90, almost 91 per cent of cases with a current liability, where contributing another uh, record high. And to give members some context, in, in the United Kingdom, the number of cases contributing in March stood at 85 per cent. This means that we significantly outperformed GB, getting more of our cases paying on time. And that was uh, something that I think that we should be uh, considerably uh, pleased with. Last year we achieved 98 per cent accuracy levels across the work, and again that outperformed GB, who only achieved 95 per cent. So the CMS increased both the quantity and the quality of what they do, meaning more money for more children right across Northern Ireland. I call Michelle McElveen for supplementary. Thank you, and I'd just like to thank the Minister for his response and to congratulate both him and his predecessor, who just happens to be sitting beside me, on the work of his department in, in achieving those results. But further to this, can the Minister perhaps explain what impact this has had in reducing the outstanding debt balance? Yes, well, obviously reducing the non-paying cases and getting more money flowing has certainly contributed to reducing the amount of child maintenance out, uh, that's outstanding. In our recently published accounts, the amount of outstanding child maintenance debt during 2013-2014 had fallen by uh, almost well, 2.69 million. And during the same period, we, we reduced our non-paying cases by nearly 1,000. So there is a clear link between arrears and the, uh, the complaint cases. So there is no doubt that the Child Maintenance Service today is a totally different organisation to that which was first established some 20 years ago. And these results are the combination of some very hard work by the staff and the service. And I want to, to pay tribute to them because it is an exceptionally difficult uh, field of work. It is very challenging for my staff and for those who are involved in the child maintenance service. And I believe that this is something which has been of benefit. However, I would have to say this, that there, we would give a note of caution because there can be no complacency. Uh, and there is undoubtedly many challenges which face communities and families. And we want to be there to ensure that this organisation is there to help and to be of a positive contribution to those families in a particular need. Question two has been withdrawn. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to ask the Minister in relation to a subject matter that I previously probed through the previous Minister in relation to the lack of bungalow and new build with the housing associations. And I want to give an example of an, an eight, a young family with a child, wheelchair users, eight and a half years waiting for the date of application to get that build. At the present time, we're talking about one in every hundred new build programs as a bungalow. Is the minister in a position to review that, that regulation or the influence that the housing Act can bring to bear in terms of ensuring that disabled people and older people are not discriminated against across Northern Ireland? Thank the member. And can I also thank the member for his work that he has done 
in relation to this particular issue. And he, is, he is one of the members of this House who uh, continues to bring to his work uh, a commitment and uh, a particular focus, which I reflect his own personal priorities, and I, I think he's to be commended for that. Uh, at the 31st of March of this year, there was a total number of 21,781 bungalows within the social housing sector. This equates to almost one-fifth of the social housing stock, meaning the majority of need can be met through the current bungalow stock. However, I understand that the Housing Executive is currently reviewing the bungalow provision within the Housing Development Programme. And even though a restriction has been applied in my department's Housing Association Guide, to ensure uh, that land is maximised to its full potential, it doesn't mean that bungalows are prohibited. And in fact, uh, in Charlemont, just a few weeks ago, I cut the first sod on a new social housing scheme where one of the homes will be bestoke wheel, uh, a wheelchair bungalow. So there are needs that are beginning to be met. However, I still think that there is further work that we need to be doing in relation to the particular issue that the member raises. Call Pat Ramsey for supplementary. Yeah, yeah, I thank the Minister for his response, but I also want to say to him, you know, in terms of the social mix, in terms of new build programme, there's not much point in allocation of 100 homes in my own constituency to single parents and the social issues that's created by that. There needs to be a change of focus. And could I ask the Minister, would he be prepared to meet myself and others representing disabled and older people do you have a discussion around how we can improve those circumstances? Yes, uh, I would be more than happy to meet with the member. Uh, and as, as the House knows, I have endeavoured to ensure that where those requests have come, uh, much to uh, the annoyance probably uh, of uh, my diary secretary and uh, maybe more importantly the Minister of Home Affairs, who is my wife, uh, my diary remains completely uh, choker block over, has been the last few weeks and will continue to be so. However, that is for me the priority to ensure that where a member raises these particular concerns, I'm quite happy to meet the member and those that he wants to identify. And I will also ensure that before that, that we have more information for the member, particularly around the issue of allocations in his own constituency. Question number four is being withdrawn. I call David McNary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This is my first opportunity to congratulate the Minister on his appointment, and I do so willingly and trust that he will uh, endeavour to look after my Strangford constituency. <laughs> will the Minister tell us how many senior staff at Grade 5 and above there are in his department and how much they actually cost annually? Well, I can thank the Member for his uh, words of congratulations and I can give him the assurance as I have given to I trust all the members in the House that I will endeavour to have a listening ear to uh, the issues that were raised by him, whether it is in Strangford or in any other part of Northern Ireland. I do not have the, the specific figures and you would not expect me to have them in relation to the Grade 5s that are my uh, in my uh, department. However, what I will say is that uh, we now have a situation where, because of the budget process, uh, I now, over the next number of weeks, will have to be seriously looking at the issue of staff, not only in terms of uh, the programmes that the department uh, delivers, but also in terms of the complement of staff. I think within the Department of Social Development, which covers a range of organisations, the Social Security Agents, the Child Maintenance Service, Voluntary Community and the Housing Executive, I think it equates to almost 26 per cent of the Northern Ireland Civil Service uh, complement. So it is an issue, but I will come back to the member with the specific numbers in terms of the Grade 5. Call David McNary. He may have the answer, but I'm sure he'll come back to me if he doesn't on, the, on my supplementary. Could I ask uh, the Minister, uh, what opportunities for sharing non-specialist administrative staff has the Minister sought out with other departments and agencies? Well, again, I think that uh, he raises a point which just uh, this week I have uh, asked to have a discussion, for example, with the Minister for Department of Learning and Employment, because, as you will know, uh, when we come to the implementation of welfare reform, there are particular concerns that I have in relation to jobs and benefit offices and also where you have Social Security Agency and where you have uh, Dell staff. And, uh, the 
permanent secretaries. We have uh, asked them to meet in relation to this issue. And Minister Farry and I have had a brief discussion in relation to the issue, and we intend to meet because I think that's one example, and there may be others. And I am quite happy and will undoubtedly be put in a position over the next number of weeks where we will have to look at inventive ways of ensuring that we stay within our budget, but that equally we also continue to deliver the service which the public expects of us to deliver. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister advise if there has been any improvement in the performance of housing, executive, or housing associations? Sorry. Uh, thank the, the member. If she had asked me, uh, had there been any improvement in the, the uh, performance of the housing executive, I would have maybe taken longer to have given that particular answer because I think it's no uh, secret that I, since coming to office, have had concerns and continue to have concerns about uh, the capacity of the housing executive. However, we have had a number of meetings and we're going to continue with those over the next number of weeks. In terms of housing associations, I'm pleased to report that over the past five years there's been a significant improvement in the performance of housing associations. For example, there are currently only four housing associations have failed the inspection as opposed to ten housing associations back in 2010. And I also can advise that in 2010, 42 per cent of the social housing stock was being managed by associations who had failed the maintenance element of inspections, and this is now down to 3 per cent. So I think that that would indicate that progress has been made. Uh, however, I still believe, as I indicated when I attended and spoke at the Housing Association's annual conference, that there is a journey that we have now both embarked on, and there is still some progress that we need to make. I call Pam Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, again, and uh, thank the Minister for his answer and, and recognise that progress that is being made and welcome that. Can the Minister outline what efforts his department is making to ease the regulatory burden on housing associations? Yes, I think that uh, that was an issue that has been raised, and I think it is raised across a number of, of organisations in terms of, of the uh, regulatory uh, impact and, and the difficulties that regulation brings. And obviously, uh, this falls within the remit of the social housing reform programme, which is a vast programme which covers a variety of elements, uh, both within organisations and tenants and, and all the component parts. But given the improved performance of the housing associations over the past few years, I'm keen to consider what changes we can implement to the inspection regime uh, and how we can make that process less intrusive and onerous while still achieving uh, appropriate level of assurance. That was the assurance that we gave at the conference that we spoke at, and I am uh, in the process of trying to work through how we will be able to deliver the promise that we made that would make it less arduous for housing associations in terms of how they deliver on their programmes. I call Martin O'Mullier. Kurt Kermoy, your last concordia. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the Minister on his appointment as well, since it's my first time uh, not only addressing him but addressing uh, this particular question time. Uh, it's also appropriate to, uh, as I move to my question, to convey the thanks of the NI Federation of Housing Associations for his emphasis on social housing and on homelessness when I addressed him after you had addressed him uh, last month. And it's that question of homelessness which has, I suppose, predominated this question today, which I want to address. The latest figures I have, Minister, show that just over 4,600 presented as homeless in the last quarter. That's from April to the end of June. Can the member uh, come to a question, uh, please? Absolutely. Uh, a, slight, a, slight a slight increase. I wanted to ask the minister, how is he going to get the appropriate resources to address this? And I know you've already the, the word crisis earlier on, but this clearly grave and urgent need uh, for social housing. Uh, thank the member and, and welcome the member to, to the chamber in terms of this role uh, as far as asking questions here today is concerned. But I think in, in terms of this, th there is an issue that we need to, uh, and I said this some weeks ago, there were two things that we needed to address in terms of, of houses and, and homelessness and housing provision generally. One, change the language that we use and two, change the financial structure. Within the housing executive, there is a definition that is given of homeless. And I have repeatedly asked the housing executive to give us what really is, you know, how many people are really homeless. 
So how many people in Northern Ireland tonight will, will not have a home? And it's very hard for them to give us a definite figure. I've seen figures of 22 or 23. But in terms of those who are in housing need, those are completely different issues. And I do think, and I've had discussions, for example, with the Simon community. In fact, just uh, last week, I met with representatives from the Simon community uh, on a number of these issues because I do believe that we have to ensure that the system of how they make an application, how they are assessed, what really is their need, and of course the vexed question of location. Because when we come to sometimes dealing with some very difficult situations that families face, and if you look at the figures, they will indicate that a lot of the figures are based on uh, breakups in family and the family unit and particular domestic situations. We need to ensure that the appropriate location is being offered to people who present themselves as homeless. And what we are not doing is we are not allowing the system to be abused in a way that people get into the system because they have been inventive. But we, I, and I'm committed to ensuring that we address the need, but it will take a, a collective approach between Minister the executive at my department and the community and voluntary organisations to ensure that Minister's we are adequately addressing up. the needs of the constituency that he refers to. And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Social Development. And we now move